the let's let's go to acts chapter 1 acts chapter 1 i want to talk to you about the last words of jesus the last words that the lord jesus spoke while he was on this earth praise god in acts chapter 1 I'll start reading from verse number 4 Acts chapter 1 verse 4 Okay It says on one occasion while he was eating with them do you know Jesus liked to eat so he gave them this command do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about for John baptized with water but in a few days you will be baptized with the holy spirit now i just want to pause and mention this one thing to you uh, other than the fact that jesus like to eat is that he gave them a commandment a command and that command was don't go anywhere but wait in jerusalem until you receive the holy spirit in other words to be baptized with the holy spirit and speak in other tongues it is a command it is not an option it is not a luxury it's not a uh, you know it's, a, it's it's not a thing of take it or leave it you know you can receive it if you want if you don't like it don't receive it but it's a command he gave a command to his disciples and whenever the bible says a command that's an imperative it's for every believer god wants every believer to be baptized with the holy ghost to be filled with the holy spirit and speaking in tongues speaking in tongues is the evidence that you have received the baptism of the holy spirit so these things are very 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 important are you with me yeah. so he gave them a commandment and he said to them uh, don't leave jerusalem but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about for john baptized with water but in a few days you'll be baptized with the holy spirit then they gathered around him and asked him lord are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to israel now <laughs> this is interesting because <coughs> jesus is talking about the baptism of the holy spirit and their response is is that when you are going to restore the kingdom to israel and i always thought where 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 did that come from with well, jesus is talking about the baptism of the holy spirit and they're saying is that when you're going to restore the kingdom to israel and you know i never understood it all my christian life i mean i've been in the ministry 42 years and and uh, and and being saved 43 years and it was only recently when i began to study some history that i understood where they were coming from and i want to share that with you so we understand the historical background of the time now when jesus came around when he came into the scene the people of israel had lived under foreign occupation for little bit less than 4 centuries okay now the the people of israel they were a very proud nation because they knew that they were god's chosen people they knew that they had a covenant with god they knew that the law and the prophets had come through them and not through any other nation so they had a very special standing with god and they had the promises and all that so they were they you know and plus they had always had their own kingdom and their own kings and so they were a proud nation but now for almost four centuries which is a long long time just think four centuries is longer uh, it's it's you know it's longer than australia has has been inhabited by by people you know so you'd think that four centuries they have lived under foreign occupation and all they longed for during this period was they wanted their own kingdom back that's all they wanted so the first country the first nation to occupy them were the babylonians the babylonians came and occupied them then the babylonians left after the babylonians had gone then came the seleucid greeks now the greeks were uh, had a very strong cultural and linguistic heritage wherever the greeks went they left behind their language and their culture so although they uh, they had just think that when jesus came around actually when the books of the new testament were written 
The Greeks had been gone for over a century. Yet, the writers of the books of the New Testament, although their home language, their everyday language was Aramaic, and Hebrew was their religious language, when they wrote the books of the New Testament, they wrote the books of the New Testament in Greek. Because this was the, the, you know, the heritage that the Greeks had left behind. They deeply influenced the culture and, you know, and the language of the people of Israel. They, they thought like, like Hellenists, that's what they called themselves, people who lived under uh, you know, that, that Greek influence. So, uh, so the Greeks came and then the Greeks left, leaving their language and their culture behind. Then after the Greeks left, then came the Romans. And the Romans were the worst of all. When Jesus came to the scene, the Romans had been around for about 70 years. And they ruled, I mean, they had a very oppressive rule. First of all, uh, they had a taxation system, which was basically extortion. That is why in the days of Jesus, you will notice in the Bible that the tax collectors were the most hated people. Because they used to you know, extort taxes on the people and they used to keep a percentage for themselves. And the more they got out of the people, the more their share was. And so they were absolutely hated by the people. Then the Romans used to carry out summary executions. They executed people, killed them left and right for small reasons. So the people hated the Romans. And into this situation comes Jesus. So for four centuries, these people had, had, were kind of, they were longing for the Messiah. And for them, the Messiah uh, was a military deliverer. Because you know, what happens is that when we are in a situation a long time, we tend to interpret the scriptures through the prism of our circumstances and our experiences. And we do that too. And those people in those days, they did the same thing. Whenever they would read scriptures pertaining to the Messiah that said, the Messiah will come and he'll establish his kingdom, it'll be forever. So they thought, oh, the Messiah will be a military ruler. He's going to throw our occupiers away. You know, he's going to throw them off and he's going to establish his kingdom and the kingdom of Israel be established again. So during this four centuries, there had been many uh, uprisings against, first against the Babylonians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. But all these uprisings had been crushed. And all the, all the leaders of these uprisings were prospective mess, you know, messianic candidates, you can say. But they were all crushed, they, and they, were all, they had all failed, except for one man called Judas Maccabeus, whose name, even today in, in, in the land of Israel, you know, he has monuments and things named after him. Israel's main soccer club, football club, is called the Maccabees. You know, I mean, Judas Maccabeus is in Israeli folklore as a big hero. But uh, he, he managed to liberate a small chunk, chunk of territory where he established a kingdom, a Jewish kingdom, called the Hasmonean Kingdom. And, uh, and the ruler of that kingdom was his younger brother, and it was called the Hasmonean Kingdom because Maccabeus came from the Hasmonean dynasty. But that lasted a few, de a few decades, and then the Romans came and destroyed that also. So when, and here comes Jesus, and by this time, the people are really fed up of all this occupation. They're looking for a Messiah. They're looking for the next person who has the potential of driving the Romans out. And into this situation comes Jesus. And there's two things about Jesus that stood out the most. The first thing was that he spoke as no man had spoken. His words were with power. When he spoke, demons would come out of people, and there was such wisdom and life in his words. And at one place we read how the, how the soldiers were sent to arrest him, and they came back empty-handed, and they, and they were asked, why didn't you bring him in? And they said, how could we? No man has ever spoken like him. You know, he was amazing. The second thing about Jesus was that he had miracles. Nobody else had miracles. He could make the lame to walk, the blind to see, and all that, and he did all those miracles. So because of that, the people began to think he could be the next Messiah. He is the Messiah. Now, in the days of Jesus, there, were, there was this one group called the Zealots. In fact, one of them was Simon the Zealot, and he became one of the disciples of Jesus. The Zealots were those were the freedom fighters, and they kind of followed Jesus around, and they watched him, and then he did his great miracle. The greatest miracle, I mean, numerically speaking, is what we call the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus, through one miracle, 
He fed, you know, the Bible says 5,000 men plus women and children. So historians estimate there must have been 20,000 people who were fed that day. And when they saw Jesus feed 20,000 people with two little sardines and five bread rolls, that was it. The Bible says that they tried to make him king by force. Why? Because he was not interested. They said, look, whether you like it or not, you are it, you know. You are the king. But Jesus, you know, the interesting thing was that he didn't, not only didn't he, he didn't want to be their king, but during these years, he saw all the oppression around him. He never made one single political statement against the Romans. He seemed to be totally oblivious to what was going around, around him. The only time he ever even came close to making a political statement was when they asked him. They said, it, you know, they're always trying to set him up to say something that would get him into trouble. And they said, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And he said, okay, give me a coin. Whose picture is on this coin? Caesar, fine, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You give to God what is God's. That was the closest he ever came to making a political statement. And, but what did he do? He talked about the kingdom of God. He seemed to be seeing something that they couldn't see. He, he was looking at something that they couldn't look at. That was invisible to them. He talked about the kingdom of God. He talked about the coming kingdom and all that. And he seemed to be totally, totally oblivious to what was happening around him. And I can only imagine the frustration that they had felt. And then what does he do? Then he goes and dies upon the cross. When he dies upon the cross, all their dreams die with him. But Jesus was the ultimate comeback man. After three days, I mean, no one has ever made a comeback like that. He's dead, he's buried, and after three days, he rises again. Jesus makes his comeback. And when he, come, when he comes back to life, their dreams are resurrected with him. And they begin to follow him again. When is he going to do something? When is he going to make his move? When are we going to, you know, they couldn't give up that dream of their kingdom being restored. And then comes the last day. Jesus gathers them together. He says, come on, boys, let me talk to you. He says, now listen, don't go anywhere, but wait in Jerusalem until you receive that which I told you about. John immersed people in water. In a few days, you'll be immersed with the Holy Ghost. And then they thought, this is it. Or is that when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And what he said next totally dashed all their hopes. He says, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. He says, these things don't concern you. It is not for you to know. Now, let us pause here one more time. They didn't know the times and the dates. We know them now. Because we look back into history. You can't see the future, but you can always learn from history. You can learn from the past. So we look back, back at the past, and when you read the past, you'll see what happens. You see that uh, Jesus he died on the cross. He rose again. And he said, it's not for you to know the times or the dates. And then he ascended to heaven, sat at the right hand of the Father. After Jesus sat on the right hand of the Father, what happened was that life for Israel, the Israelites carried on as usual. The Romans went around, the Romans went around killing and executing people. And finally, around the year 70 AD, about 35 years after the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension of Jesus, there was yet one more uprising. And by this time, the Romans had enough of the Jews and their uprisings. And so they sent their general Titus all the way from Rome. He came marching with two legions, two armies all the way from Rome. They sent Titus because Titus was known for his exceptional brutality. Titus came and he set about killing as many Jews as he could. He killed thousands of Jews and he, he destroyed the city of Jerusalem and reduced it to rubble. Totally destroyed the city of Jerusalem so that today, 2,000 years later, archaeologists are still digging, trying to figure out where those different buildings were that are mentioned in the Bible. We really don't know. 
a lot of the places that we think, you know, that they say this is where Jesus was born, this is where, that, those were identified by the mother of the emperor Constantine, who thought that these are the places, but there's no evidence. We don't really know. So they're still trying to figure all that out. I mean, so effective was he in destroying the city of Jerusalem and the Jews were scattered to the four corners of the earth and they never got their kingdom. The temple was destroyed and it was 2,000 years that they could come back to the land and that only two of the 12 tribes came back and the other 10 tribes are still scattered and they're looking for them. You know, they're still trying to, when I was in India, I was doing a crusade in the far northeast of India. I saw some Orthodox Jews and I had a conversation with them and they said, we are anthropologists. We are taking DNA samples and checking to see if any of the tribes of Israel are in this area. They're still looking. So, but you know, that is history. We see that. And God does have a purpose for the Jews, for the Israelites. And he said that he will bring them back to the land, but we don't know how he will do it, but he's going to do it, you know, and all that, all that is going to happen. But you think of it, that is history. But out of the turbulent time in history, Jesus, he said, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that the father has decided. But what happened was that after Jesus ascended to heaven, the Holy Ghost came down on the day of Pentecost. And out of the turbulent time in history, there was born something called the church. And God chose that he should fulfill his purpose of making his name known to the nations through the church because Israel had been scattered. And that church that was started, that was born on the day of Pentecost. It has become an unstoppable force and we have become the mightiest nation on this earth. First of all, we don't have national boundaries. We don't have a national flag. We don't have a, have a seat in the United Nations. We don't have a, um, a parliament. We don't have a prime minister, but we have a king King of kings and the Lord of lords. Who doesn't have a palace somewhere around here, but he is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. But here's the interesting thing. Wherever the gospel goes, it turns things upside down and you will see millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people who have given their allegiance to this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And his, his dominion over them is so total that those who believe in him, their loyalty and allegiance to Jesus Christ is stronger than their loyalty and allegiance to the country where they are born. That is the hold that Jesus has. So we have this powerful nation on this earth. We don't have a standing army. We don't have a navy. We don't have an air force. We don't have a seat in the United Nations. But wherever they go, all the dictators and the, and the rulers of this earth, they fear us because they're afraid what would happen if the gospel gets into our nation. Hallelujah. That is the power. That is the hold that Jesus Christ has on the hearts of men. Amen? Amen? And what a privilege it is for you and us to be part of it. Because he says in Hebrews 11, he said, once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Every kingdom shall be shaken, but the kingdom of God will only grow and grow and grow and increase and it can never be shaken. Amen. Now that is history. But let's go back to our text. It is not for you to know the times or dates that the father has said by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes on you. In other words, Jesus is saying that it's not for you to know the days or the times about the establishment or the re-establishment of the kingdom. But I'm telling you what concerns you. That the Holy Spirit 
is going to come to this earth. That was a monumentous occasion because the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. You know, most of us have this view that, uh, charismatics have this view that, you know, there is a God, he's this old guy with a big beard and then you got this little guy, Jesus, seated on his right hand side and then, the, then you got this pink cloud who floats around. <laughs> You know, he's the Holy Spirit and he sometimes comes here and people will fall down. Other people will laugh and oh, the Holy Ghost was here and I felt him, you know. But listen, the Holy Spirit is not an influence or a power that floats around. The Holy Spirit is God. Yes. Now, we call him, the Bible doesn't call him the third person of the Trinity. We call him the third person of the Trinity. But... The first, second, and third person of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are co-equal. Third person doesn't mean he's the junior partner. <laughs> there is one God. There's only one God, but he has revealed himself as three persons, and they're co-equal. Okay? But here's the difference between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is on the throne in heaven. Jesus is that person of the Godhead who came to on this down to this world, became a man, died for us, went to Hades, rose up from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and is interceding for us. Okay? The Holy Spirit is, the third, is that person of the Trinity who is actually here. And everything that the Father and the Son say or do on this earth, they do through the Holy Spirit. So when I say, well, God is doing this, we're actually talking about the Holy Spirit because the three are one. Are you with me? Right? So the Holy Spirit is here. So that is why your relationship with the Holy Spirit, your personal relationship with the Holy Spirit as an individual, and the relationship of a church, a congregation with the Holy Spirit, are of utmost importance if you are to move forward in life. And that is why, you know, there is never any conflict among the churches about who God is, who the Father is, or even Christology, which means you know, who Jesus is, we all basically agree. But where the conflict is, who the Holy Spirit is and what he does today. That's where churches disagree. Some will say, well, the Holy Spirit is real, but he doesn't really do anything on this earth. At least he doesn't do the things that he did 2,000 years ago. He doesn't heal the sick and all that, you know. And because, you see, the devil knows that if he can keep the Holy Spirit out of your life, he has you exactly where he wants you. He makes you powerful and without influence. That is why our relationship with the Holy Spirit is of utmost importance. That is why Jesus said, he says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons, the dates that the Father has decided, but when the Holy Spirit shall come and the Holy Spirit, Jesus spoke, about it in the future, but we look back at it in history, the Holy Spirit came to this earth 2,000 years ago. That's good news for us. And he's here. But then he said, when the Holy Spirit shall come, not only to this earth, but upon you. And I'm challenging you about your personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, my brother, my sister. What is the depth of your, you know, we, people talk about relationship with the Holy Spirit as if he was an equal, as if he was a buddy. No, it's not your relationship with the Holy Spirit, but it is your total submission to him. Because our relationship with God is not based as equals that, you know, Jesus is my big brother, God is my daddy, and you know, that kind of, no. There's no familiarity there. Our relationship with God is based on submission. That is the foundation for our relationship. So the question is, the Holy Spirit has come, but he wants to come upon you. And I want to ask you, has he come upon you? Does he have a place in your life? And if he does have a place in your life, what is the level of your submission? And so, because it's not really a question of how much the Holy Spirit you have, but it's a question of how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? How deep is your surrender? How much of you does he have? And that is a challenge, beloved, for you and me today as believers in our day. 
When the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. That means the Holy Spirit wants to come upon you. And you to surrender total, totally to him. And give yourself to him. So you become a vessel for him. When he shall come upon you. The Bible tells us what will happen. You shall receive power. And that word power is the Greek word dynamis. Which actually in today's language can be translated as brute force. It's the ability, it's the power of God. You shall receive power. And to give you an idea, that is the word that is used in Mark chapter 5. When Jesus was walking and the woman with the issue of blood, she touched his garment she, and she said, if I touch his garment, I shall be made whole. And you remember she came and touched him. And when he, he, she touched him, she was healed. And Jesus said, somebody touch me. And the disciple says, who touched you? And he said, somebody touch me because I felt dynamis. I felt virtue some uh, or power flow from me so that was that's the same word that was used so what Jesus was saying was to his disciples was that if you remember when we were walking to the house of Jairus and that woman with the issue of blood who was dying came and touched my garment and there was this divine substance that flowed from my my clothes and healed her what Jesus is saying is that when the Holy Ghost shall come upon you you shall receive that very same divine substance you shall receive that very same power it is going to flow from you now many will say but I've been a Christian pastor for many years I don't have it flow through me why 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 we go to seminars how it can have more power simple answer it is very often that our expectations don't rise to the level of the promises of God do you understand? Yes. Everything is tied to faith. We must raise our expectations from God to the level of his promises. Because if God has said something, we must learn to take him at his word and say, Father, I believe this because you are the one who came up with this. You are the one who said this. You are the one who said it, so I want it. And not only do I want it, I take it, I receive it by faith. And now I'm going to go out and act as if I have it because you said I will receive it. And I want you to honor your word and do what you promise you will do. And believe me, God is going to do it. Amen. Don't wait to feel something. Or someone to come and prophesy over you to affirm it. If it is in the word, you don't need a prophecy. Are you with me? If it is in the word, you should treat it as if it is money in the bank. It belongs to you. Amen. 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 So what Jesus was saying is that when the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, you shall receive power. You shall receive the same thing that flowed through me. When it touched that woman, when it flowed into that woman and healed her. Then it tells us why we shall receive that power. He says, and you shall be my witnesses. The reason God gives us that power is not so that I can have a healing ministry, but so that I can be a witness for Jesus. Amen. If you as a believer want to find out how much power God has invested in you, the place to find out is not in your Bible study group or in church, but go out where the sinners are. Go out to the lost. That's when you'll find out. You shall be my witnesses. A witness is a man or a woman who can give evidence. Many years ago, I witnessed a crime and the police took my statement, took my address and I was called to court. And the first thing they asked me, were you there? If I had said, no, I wasn't there. I read about it in the newspaper. <laughs> I'm not a witness. A witness is somebody who has seen and experienced something. And the Bible tells us that in the early days in the book of Acts, they didn't have the gospels, they didn't have the epistles. You know what they preached? It says, with great power, they gave testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. They had one message, you crucified him, we saw him risen and he's alive and, he, and this is the proof that he's alive. Signs, wonders and miracles are a proof 
that Jesus Christ is alive. Signs, wonders and miracles are not about your ministry or my ministry, but it is about Jesus Christ being alive. Amen. Evidence. We shall give evidence, we shall prove to people that Jesus Christ is alive. You know, all these years I go and witness to people and some people are hard nuts to crack. You know, Muslim people and you know, people like to argue, people like to discuss and I'm not a great arguer or a discusser. I have very little patience with people who like to argue and discuss. I say, okay, fine, let's do this. I say, let, let me pray for you. And if God heals you, then you believe in Jesus, will you? Oh yeah. And if God doesn't heal you, then you can say, I'm a liar, you know? And you might say, can you really do that? Yeah. I've never seen a person not healed. Never. Never. You Put God to test, to test his word, God will always pass the test. Amen. 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 You shall be my witnesses. Then he tells us where we shall be witnesses. The first place he said in Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem is your home turf. That's where you come from. Everyone knows you. You know everybody. Then in Judea. Judea was the greatest, the greater area where the Jews lived. That was their territory. Then he said Samaria, Samaria, those people are people who are different to you. They have another religion. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, why are you even talking to me? We are not supposed to have any, you know, communication with one another. You worship in Jerusalem, we worship on this mountain. We have different religions and they didn't like one another. That's why they were not supposed to talk to one another. But Jesus went there to witness, to testify. And because he did so, the people of Samaria were saved. So God has called us to be witnesses in the territory of those people who people don't like, who you think are your, you know, your rivals, your enemies. People don't like them. Nowadays, I see on the, inter on the internet, and it really bothers me when Christians... Aussie Christians and American Christians are world champions at this. They come on Facebook and they write these posts about how bad the Muslims are and the Muslims are taking over their country. Listen, God sent them here so that you can win them for Jesus. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Even if there's some came with wrong intention, most of them are ordinary human beings. You'll get to know them. You'll find out they were people. They are just people like you. But they are misled. They have another religion. That's what they grew up in. Now, there are a few bad ones. But the Bible says, what do you do with people like that? The Bible says, overcome evil with good. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Overcome evil with good. That's what the Bible says. We don't have a mandate to criticize people. And tell them we don't want them here. They're already here. There's nothing you can do about it. The best thing you can do about it is be a witness for Jesus. Be a first class disciple. Be a first class, a top rate witness for Jesus. Who is able to take the power of God to those people. <laughs> to Jerusalem. To Judea and to Samaria. And then he says to the ends of the earth. Our mandate is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Which is astounding because, you know, Jesus was a Jew. His disciples were Jews. And one thing about the Jews, if you talk to the Jewish people, the Jewish people have no desire to dominate the earth. There are other nations, you know, they want to take the whole world and control it. You know, you got the Russians, you got Putin, he wants the whole Soviet empire back. And, and the Chinese, wherever there's two Chinese people, they think it should be part of China, you know. <laughs> you know, they're, 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 they're like that, you know. Then you had Hitler, you had people. But the Jewish people, no. If you ask them, what do you want? They said, look, we don't want anything. We just want a little strip of land. It's 30 kilometers wide and 100 kilometers long. It's in the Middle East, by the Mediterranean Sea. And God promised that to Abraham. Just give us that and we'll leave you alone. You leave us alone. That's all we want. But Jesus is different. He's a different kind of Jew. He wants to dominate the earth. 
And the Bible says that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And he has told us, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Because the gospel shall be, shall be preached all over the earth. He says, to the ends of the earth. Let me finish with a story about taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. You know, when I was a kid, I don't know how old I was, but I was maybe seven or eight years old, nine years old. Was like, I don't remember exactly when I was very small. And my father was transferred to a place called East Pakistan, which is now known as Bangladesh. So he was transferred there. I lived there when I was small. And my father had taught me to hunt and shoot from the time I was five years of age. So one day he says, uh, son, we are going on a, on a wild elephant hunt. So I got very excited. We're going to shoot elephants. And dad said, no, no, we are not going to shoot elephants. In fact, he says, the jungles out here are full of wild elephants. And he said, what, what people do is that they capture these elephants. Then they tame them and domesticate them. And they use these elephants to... Uh, you know, farmers use them to plow their fields. They use them for logging and mining operations up in the mountains where trucks cannot go. They use these elephants to do all the heavy work. So we'll see how they catch these elephants and we'll watch this process. So we drove two days through the jungle on jeeps. And then I remember we entered, we crossed the border into Burma, which is now Myanmar. And when we, and we watched the whole process, how they, it was very fascinating. I still remember everything clearly, how they caught these wild elephants and they trained them and all that. But anyway, while I was there, I heard a voice or it was either a voice or, or an impression or I can't really say I was so small, which said to me, one day you're going to come back to this nation and you're going to do some big things here. I was just a little kid. I didn't know where that came from, what it was. I forgot all about it. Well, I think about 38 years passed. God opened the door for me to go to Burma. And uh, I did some indoor meetings there. And when I came there, that time the country was under a very strong military dictatorship. Churches were being bulldozed and people were killed and in prison, they were being tortured, it was terrible, bad, you know, I mean, what was happening in Myanmar until a few years ago. So I went there, and uh, when I was there, there were these thousands of people in this meeting, and we were seeing miracles, people getting saved and healed, and then that voice from about 38, 40 years back came back to me, and I remembered. Then I understood I'm here with a purpose. So anyway, immediately after I left, there was persecution because the army found out of, about what we were doing and the persecuted, they arrested all the pastors who had hosted me and they, you know, they tortured them. They wrote to me, they said, Pastor, we want you back, but please wait for a year until things calm down. So I went back after a year. When I went back after a year, I was praying and I had an experience in five days, I had three open visions. Now, an open vision is when I'm seeing a vision, but I'm not asleep. It's not like a, that kind of vision, but it's like I'm wide awake and I see the vision like I'm seeing you, but I don't see you. I see that other reality that God is showing me. That's an open vision. I had three open visions in five days, and they were long open visions, and I've never had that happen before. I've never had that happen since. There was those three days. That's when it was. And I don't want to go into all of this, but one of the things the Lord said to me, I want you to come back to this nation and begin to preach the gospel and to plant churches. And I said, Lord, please find somebody else to do it. <laughs> and the Lord said, why? I said, because I want to live. I don't like being tortured or beaten up. I, 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 I don't like it. And then the Lord said, do you remember? What happened in the summer of 1977? And I said, please, please don't bring it up again. What happened in 1977? You know, I got saved in December 75. 
I had spent the whole of uh, 76 in prison for preaching the gospel. I managed to escape in 1977. The pastor who had baptized me had been killed by the fundamentalists because he baptized me. And then, uh, you know, and now it's 77, I had managed to escape to Europe. And I've just been through all this. And I was with an organization known as Operation Mobilization. And our leader, George Verber, he was a fanatic. I mean, he's about 86 years old and he's still a fanatic. The man was absolutely fanatic. He used to preach things like, your life is worth nothing unless you're laying it down for the gospel and, you know, must preach the gospel and preach the gospel and win the lost and, you know, don't live a comfortable life. And so we were brainwashed by him, you know. He, he got under our skin. We were on edge, you know. We wanted to go. And then I got to know him and he gave me a book called The Calvary Road. He says, uh, I want you to read this. So I remember I read the, the first chapter of The Calvary Road and I just cried. And I, then I read the rest of the book on my knees with tears flowing down my cheeks, you know. The Calvary Road really got me and I came to him. By that time, I was wiped, finished, you know. And then he gave me another book. He said, I read the book. I said, yeah, he gave me another book. And the title was Come, Live and Die. And that, that just, I know. You look at the title and that's all you need, you know. I read, oh my goodness, come live and die. Then I read, come live and die. And every time he'd see me, did you read, come live and die? I, Pastor, I'm still reading it, you know. I finished, I'd read by time, I had read, come live and die. I was looking for a place where I could go and die and preach the gospel. Then one day he gave like a, you know, those who want to lay down their lives for the gospel. And I ran to the front and I was on my knees with tears flowing down my cheeks. And I said, Jesus, send me wherever you want me to go. I'm ready to die. And I've regretted those words ever <laughs> since. I remember asked God, I said, God, why do you send me to Malawi when others go to Maui, you know, <laughs> and things like that. So I was, I, you know, so anyway, so then the Lord said, do you remember the summer of 1977? And he, that's not the first time the Lord said that. I said, yeah, yeah, please, please don't repeat that. You got to understand at that time I was a single guy. Now I've got a wife and kids and and, you know, I, I want to live. I enjoy my life. I'm enjoying that time. I didn't care. Now I care. And the Lord said, do you remember those words? I said, yes. And the Lord said, I'm holding you to your words. I said, okay, I'll go. But then I was smart, you know. I'm not a dummy. I said, Lord, if you hold me to my word, I will hold you to your word. I will go. If the Holy Ghost goes with me, but not the Holy Ghost of the churches in America, where you line the people up and there's a catcher, and then you lay your hands. If they don't fall, you give them a push. <laughs> and the people do a courtesy drop, you know? Then an usher comes with a tablecloth, puts it on the woman's legs, you know. I said, I said, Lord, in a country where they're killing Christians, that won't work. I want the book of Acts Holy Ghost. If the book of Acts Holy Ghost goes with me, I'm going. I'm all for it. The Lord said, fine. So I go back to Burma. I do my first crusade. I preach and I do the altar call. People come. It was all indoors in a big place. And and then I pray, I'm saying, okay, all the sick come forward and all the sick, they, somehow the pastors got them standing on one side and they're bringing them, you know, like a line, you know, one by one I'm praying. So while I'm praying, I notice out of the corner of my eye, there was three men, they're holding up this guy, propping up this guy. He was wearing like hospital pajamas, you know, the striped pajamas that they always have in hospitals. So he was wearing that and there were two guys holding this IV bottles, intravenous, and there was tubes running in. And the guy looked like a skeleton. He looked like, he was like, his eyes were sunken. He, he looked like a skeleton, like, a, like somebody dead who was just being held up, you know. And he was, uh, and then I, I was wondering, oh my goodness, who's this? What's wrong with him, you know? So while I'm praying, I see this guy just slide to the floor and he, he lay still like this. And then somebody shouted something in Burmese and there were about eight or 10 people who I, who I realized were doctors and nurses. They jumped from their seats 
And they ran and they began to check this guy and checked about five, six, seven, eight minutes. They checked him. Then one of the doctors, he spoke English. He turned to me, said, Pastor, he's dead. <laughs> I said, well, if he's dead, do something. <laughs> now, you got to understand, my wife is a nurse. She's a very highly qualified nurse, and so I, I, just to be romantic, you know, I would like to watch these medical shows with her. And I like to watch, she likes to watch medical shows, and she used to like to watch these police detective shows. So as a result, after all these years, I can do brain surgeries, I can cure <laughs> all kinds of sicknesses, I can do heart transplants, I know all these things. Plus, I can solve any crime, you know, I can, I know I'm an expert. So, so. So, so I know, I know that when someone dies, you have to give him, uh, in Swedish we call it a heart massage, you know, you, you massage their heart. So, so I said to him, I said, well, do a heart massage. I said, I can only do Pentecostal massage, you know. I said, you do. And they said, Pastor, he's dead. The man is dead. So they, then they got up and went back to their seats. And this dead man is laying, and everybody went back to the seats. The whole healing line disappeared. And, and some fool, I mean some idiot, you know what he did? He went and grabbed this dead man by the hands and dragged him and put him right in front of me. And here I am standing with a dead man in front of me. My first thought was nobody is supposed to die in a Pentecostal meeting. My second thought was, I went to Bible school in Rama Bible Training Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma under Kenneth e. Hagin, and they had never taught me to raise the dead. They taught me all kinds of things, but they never taught me to raise the dead, and I had no idea what I would do. I had never seen a dead person die in my meeting. I had never seen anyone ever attempt to raise a dead person. I'd never seen it been done. Only thing I knew, it was in the Bible. Peter raised somebody from the dead, the woman Dorcas from the dead, and Paul raised a man from the dead. Remember, Paul preached long sermons. The guy fell out the window and died. And, and then Jesus rose somebody from the dead, and, and that was it. So I just, I didn't know what to do. So I'm standing here, and the crowd is looking at me. There's a dead man in front of me. So I thought, okay, I don't know what to do, but the Holy Ghost always knows. So I thought, okay, what I'm going to do is going to be stupid, but if I'm going to make a fool of myself, I do it loudly. You know, some of us, we want to pray in tongues and we want to make sure, you know. I said, this thing won't work. I have to pray in tongues. So I took the microphone. I put one hand up and I shouted, My interpreter came running. What was that, Pastor? I said, I, said, I have no idea what I'm saying, but just stay with me. You stay with me. So I begin to pray. All these Burmese looking at me, you know. They're looking at me. I'm just shouting in tongues. I went on and on and on. I don't know how long I went on. I just went and after some time I realized that, you know, the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a Righteous man availeth much. And I realized that a righteous man, there's two elements. The person who prays has to be a righteous man. But that is not the problem because I've been made righteous through the blood of Jesus. You and I, we are all righteous through the blood of Jesus. But the thing is that the prayer has to be fervent. Fervent. And the word fervent in the Greek is the word energeo. That means a prayer that generates heat. If you want to see miracles, you have to pray the kind of prayer that raises the temperature of the room. You have to pray the kind of prayer that generates heat. You cannot expect miracles if you pray cold good night prayers. You have to pray. Pray down the fire of God. Hallelujah. Whatever it takes, you have to pray yourself from a cold place to a hot place, from a place of defeat to a place of victory, from a place of sickness and death to a place of life, you have to pray yourself out. So I began to pray. I said, I'm going to take a horn, a hold of the horns of the altar, and I'm going to pray how long it takes. So I went, oh, after some I didn't care who was looking at me. I didn't care who they thought. I went on for at least 45 minutes. I was on, going on and 
on and on and on and on non-stop. Then suddenly I heard a shout, Hallelujah! I opened my eyes, jumped up. It was the dead man. He had shot up from the floor. <laughs> Hallelujah! He had shot up from the floor like a rocket and he stood in front of me with his hands in the air and he was shouting and praising God right next to me. And I said, I got it, I got it, hallelujah. <laughs> that was all I needed. From there, I went all over Burma. And you know, in those subsequent years, we saw at least four people raised from the dead. We saw God create, like I remember this woman, she, somebody had shot an arrow in her eye, it was just destroyed. She had an empty socket, the doctors had taken it out. God created a new eye. We saw babies and children deformed, healed, lame people walking, deaf ears, you know. I mean, we saw people with no ears begin to hear. We saw the most amazing miracles and thousands of people getting saved. And in that process, we planted 178 churches under strong persecution. Hallelujah. <laughs> Beloved, we have not been baptized with ashes, but we have been baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And we have to rise up in faith and believe what God has given us and take a hold of our heritage and go out and win the world for Jesus. There is a world to be won. There is a gospel that has to be preached. Hallelujah.